to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to a Tuesday edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. It is Tuesday. It is the ninth day of December. It is a pleasure to be with you today. As usual, we're starting our Tuesday programming one half hour late. We will be taking a short break at the top of the hour, and then we'll have a full hour when we, when we come back. Um, we are going to be pursuing... Uh, the, the, the theme that we began yesterday, which was the article that Horst was kind enough to uh, refer to me uh, on the issue of Nouveau Riche in the Silicon Valley. And uh, uh, again, I, I looked at the article, read the article two or three times. It, besides being extremely well written and extremely insightful, it seems to me to raise a number of issues which I think go well beyond the Silicon Valley because uh, it, it, it raises issues that are prevalent there that are pretty much the extreme of issues that exist throughout the rest of the country. And so in a sense, those the wealthiest and most influential people in our society potentially uh, this so-called nouveau riche in the areas of of high tech and in the air in the commun in the area ages of communication it would seem to me presuming that they will assume leadership roles in our 21st century american society they are setting a tone which i think is very very significant and very important for all of us to understand and appreciate because in the course of following the lead, so to speak, we are making very serious decisions that affect not only the, the society at large, but more important, various elements of the population within that society. And so consequently, I think that these are decisions and these are issues which all of us need to be aware of, need to be cognizant of, need, need to have had the time to think through them and to basically be aware of what it is we're choosing to do and what it is we're choosing to not do. And I, I think part of the part of the issue from what we were able to cover yesterday indicated clearly that an awful lot of this is thoughtless. And to be honest with you, I think that's one of the more significant issues which makes this whole topic, it seems to me, worthwhile. I hope that you will uh, stay with us through the balance of the program today. I would love to uh, uh, to know that this particular topic is reaching uh, as many people as as possible. Um, would love to hear from you. We'd like to hear your ideas and your thoughts on these particular issues because they do affect either directly or indirectly. At some point in time, they 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 will if they don't already will affect everybody. Uh, we have a phone number that has been reserved exclusively for your use so that you can have, have the opportunity to share your ideas and your thoughts with us here at the Virtual Center, not only with me, but with other listeners as well. And, of course, your call, um, should you choose to make one, will become part of the archived program for today. And so, therefore, you will be you will have access to it. It'll be there for forever and ever and ever, whatever that might mean. And, um, you know, it, it'll be there for you if you want to copy it, if you wanted to uh, to download it and share it with friends, whatever, whatever you might like to do. Uh, our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. That's 304-663. Horn, H O R N, 4676. My email address, if you'd like to communicate with me directly via email on these issues or, or other related issues to the Virtual Center, my email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. 
www.wayobrien.com. That's W-A-O-B-R-I-E-N, O B R I E N nine zero six. No punctuation, no apostrophes or anything like that. Nine zero six at gmail dot com. To again set the stage for this particular for this particular issue about the nouveau riche in the Silicon Valley. Um, what prompted Horst? to send me the link to this article was one of our programs last week on the on the issue of class and differences within class in America in the 18th century not only through the confederation period but also as an issue that came up and was very significant although not that often focused upon at the constitutional convention and I might tell you tomorrow morning in my history class, which I'm teaching, my final exam is tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm presuming that the students in my class are home plugging away toward uh, doing well on their final exam, since this particular exam will count 40% of their final grades. So right now, going into the final, they know they have 60%. They know what 60% of their final grade is, but the 40%, uh, the final 40% of their grades will be determined by their performance on a two-hour in-class final exam. One of the questions that uh, that I have asked for, of the class, and this is one of the choices they have on the final exam is to come to grips with the excerpt from Hamilton's June 18th speech at the Constitutional Convention, the speech in which he addresses the issue of communities dividing themselves into the few and the many, the rich and the well-born being the few, the masses being the many. And he makes the point in that quotation, or in that, in that speech, that the masses generally do not judge or determine right. In other words, more often than not, they are wrong. And of course, the reason they are wrong is, you know, without saying it, is because uh, is because their priorities would obviously be self-interest. They would always be looking out for their own self-interest first. That's that's one of the assumptions that Ham that Hamilton makes, as well as Madison, I believe. And so, what what Hamilton argues is that the most important thing then is to find ways to connect the few, the rich and the well-born, to the Constitution, to the new system. And since the rich and well-born have nothing to gain by change and everything to gain by the lack of change. Hamilton's conclusion is that by connecting the rich and well-born to the government or to the system, political system, thereby you guarantee good government. There are a lot of assumptions, obviously, which drive that particular excerpt, that particular speech. But what I'm asking my students to do I, I've given them two questions related to that. I gave them the quote. And then I've asked them basically, to what extent do they see the sentiments expressed in that statement reflected in the politics of the Confederation period? In other words, do they see evidences in the 1780s in American history under the Articles of Confederation, which would g provide or give credence to Hamilton's concerns or Hamilton's point of view. And secondly, the second part of the question is to what extent does the Constitution drafted at Philadelphia address these same concerns? So what, you know, again, I'm giving them the opportunity to sound off on an issue which I think is particularly important. We spent quite a bit of time on it in class. But part of the reason I think that this issue needs to be emphasized in a course like this is because rarely is it ever addressed at all. And I think that's very significant. 
I think I think it it means something in the fact that few historians, especially those who author our textbooks, have gone out of the way to make this issue a key issue, one that students will focus on, spend time on, reflect upon, and all the rest of it. It's not that students would believe that it doesn't exist. It's the fact that by not mentioning it, you basically create the impression that it was rather insignificant. And I think that's a very, very significant issue in itself. And so consequently, given what we are dealing with today with the issues related to inequality and all the rest of it, I think the existence of class in our system in which everybody is encouraged to see themselves as middle class in a society which is highly mobile and what we are beginning to come to grips with now in our in the 21st century is the reality of that system in terms of the lack or the absence of the kind of mobility in it that was already assumed. My own particular interest has been for a long time obviously higher education and traditionally higher education has been seen as the latter to social mobility as the as the way to opportunity in American in American society but the fact of the matter is higher education has increasingly become less and less of that ticket to social mobility if you will principally because tuitions have continued to go up and up to the point that the poorer people in society are finding it more and more difficult to pursue higher education without incurring the kind of, of substantial debt that discourages the efforts to secure higher education at all. So consequently, and I think inadvertently, I don't think that any, in any way that there's any intent or any conspiracy behind this, but I do believe that the reality is that higher education is increasingly becoming the property of the well-to-do. And I think that really raises serious issues about America's future and about the future stability of this society. So I think that's, I, I, I think that's an important, a very, very important issue. But again, the issue of nouveau riche. What we were talking about was yesterday, in, in the beginning of our program, before we got into the, into the article on the Silicon Valley, is the concept of the so-called nouveau riche. And that would be the differences between so-called old money and new money. And the assumptions that drive those differences. Namely, that throughout the history of the modern West, there has been this tradition, this set of assumptions, that there are certain expectations that go with wealth and the position and power that wealth brings with it. The assumption is that those with the most wealth and thereby the most influence in society are going to be and ought to be society's leaders. They ought to set the tone. They ought to be the models, if you will, for the masses of the people in that particular society. But the assumption has, has always been that there's much more to assuming this kind of leadership role in society than merely wealth itself. That associated with the kinds of expectations of the wealthy, if you will, goes issues related to the perspective and the and the experiences, the worldview, the connections, the insights, the intelligence, the education, respect for the arts, respect for music, cosmopolitanism, all of these things which go with power and influence in society. 
and the assumption is the assumptions are that it takes time for groups, individuals, and families to acquire that kind of experience, that kind of perspective. And so consequently, it is seemingly the property, if you will, of the traditional wealth, of old money. It refers specifically to those who grew up in certain families and had certain exposure to experiences and were able to travel widely and be expo and were exposed to the arts and exposed to culture and exposed to fine literature and all the rest of it. Whereas these people who strike it rich overnight, if you will, may have the power and influence that money brings but they are missing, they, are, they do not have all of the accoutrements that go along with that power. The experiences and the perspective and the insight and the, the sense of obligations of leadership and all the rest of it that society expects from these people. <coughs> so consequently, throughout societies, and, and we talked about it yesterday as it existed in in 17th century England during its transition into commerce, into, into becoming the commercial leader of the modern world in the 17th century Great England, um, and the emergence of the middle class, the emergence of the business community, and England's ability to dominate international commerce during this period, and the extent to which this new vo these new newly rich, newly wealthy, newly influential interests in English society demanded access to the power structure of society. And the way they gained it was going through Parliament and securing control of Parliament. And consequently then, they became instrumental in what becomes the English Civil Wars and eventually the Glorious Revolution of 1688 in which Parliament is able to wrest administrative control of English society away from the Crown. And from that point on, the monarchy in England is more of a figurehead than anything else. And of course, this doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen without a fight. And I think one of the things that we need to appreciate is the fact that throughout the early, the first half of the 18th century, the monarchy the the monarchy is fighting hard to maintain and control the traditional power and traditional influence that it has had in, in English society. But you do get this clash, if you will, between the so-called old money or traditional aristocracy and this new group, these nouveau riche type of people. We saw it in last week in our programming here at the Virtual Center in American society during the 18th century, during the so-called Confederation period, after independence and through the 1780s. We saw the appearance of class. We saw the emergence of the idealism and the optimism that accompanied independence and the emergence of Republican government on the national level. The fact that the founders set out to create republics, republican forms of government in every one of the 13 newly independent states. And the idea of republican government as articulated by, by Montesquieu in his Spirit of the Laws was that in order for republicanism to work, the political area, the political constituency had to be small. The idea being that power had to be on the state level because if you put power on the national level, then the, the sphere, the political sphere, would be so large and so complex that the ideals of republicanism would be unattainable. And so the idea is the confederation period becomes a league of friendship between 13 free and independent republics. And then throughout the 1780s, certain people, the one we've been focusing on mostly, was, is James Madison. 
but it, throughout the states, a number of prominent people begin to see problems in the model, begin to see problems in American society. And increasingly, this leads to a movement to reform the articles, to revise them, and ultimately the decision to scrap them and replace them with what becomes the Constitution of the United States. And within that context, we see the emergence of this traditional struggle, or traditional difference, if you will, between so-called old money and new money. And there's a lot of resentment and a lot of fear. Because many people, as a result of independence, really believe that the old elements of the class system, the distinctions between the wealthy and the masses, were going to and should disappear. And so consequently, the independence for many people becomes kind of a social coming out party, as it were. And the traditional power structure in most states, the so-called traditional aristocracy in most states, becomes very concerned about it. And there's absolutely no question that this effort to try to keep society under control, to tone down the optimism and the level of change that's coming out of independence, coming out of 1776, is a key part of the concern about the Confederation and a key part of the thinking in the way that the Constitution of the United States is structured, is designed. And again, Matt, it, it becomes very clear, and I think we addressed this last week when we were looking at Gordon Wood's book on the creation of the American Republic. It becomes very clear, Madison says straight up, that while the system of government and putting power on the state level becomes a weakness in the Confederation, it's not structure alone that is the problem. Madison said it's really the kind of people who are able to take advantage of that structure and through popular, the, the popular aspects of republicanism are able to get their way within the states. And that's what needs to be the reform. What is happening is that power, decision making, is slipping through the hands of the people who traditionally make it and moving into the hands of people who never had the opportunity to make it before. And to Madison and Benjamin Rush and some of the others, this creates a problem because decisions are being made by majorities, by the masses, by people who do not have the experience and the perspective and the upbringing and the class and the education and the appreciation for the arts and all the other things that are, that are associated with power and influence in society. And so therefore, that's the problem that the Constitution is supposed to fix. That's the problem that Hamilton is addressing in his June 18th speech. That's the beauty of the British Constitution to Hamilton, is its ability to maintain social st structure and social stability within a government that is moving increasingly towards more and more participation by more and more people. How do you do that and at the same time maintain the kinds of traditions that Hamilton and others believe are so very, very important. And clearly, this becomes a factor in people's willingness to support the Constitution of the United States. To basically get a handle on change, get a handle on the kinds of social and political changes that are happening too fast and too frequently for too many people in the 1780s in the various states. This becomes what in the textbook we were using in this American history class which was uh, entitled The American Pageant, 
This makes it possible for the authors of this textbook to refer to the Constitution of the United States that came out of the convention as, quote, a conservative triumph, unquote. And so the question is, what does the concept of conservative triumph mean as it relates to the Constitution? And in what ways could the textbook go about saying this? This is really the issue that I've asked students to wrestle with in their final exam tomorrow. It's one of the, one of the choices that they, that they have. In the course of this discussion, one of our listeners from Taiwan, Horst, referred to this article that he had read on the idea of a nouveau riche that was emerging in the Silicon Valley where the techies, the, you know, where all the techies from around the country and around the world congregate. What kinds of changes are happening in American society which is incre increasingly being dominate, dominated by, by these individuals who are founding some of the major and most prominent corporations and employers that we see in the 21st century in America, Google and Amazon and, and Microsoft and all the rest of them. And what is there about these people that is different? And of course, one of the things that is different is that they clearly are the classic examples of what we mean by the nouveau riche. Many of them come from average families. Many of them are college dropouts. Many of them, because of their technological expertise, have been very fortunate in this technological revolution to hit it big and hit it fast. There's a couple of editorials, uh, not editorials, but opinion pieces, op-ed pieces, one in the today's New York Times and another one in today's Washington Post about the projected demise of a very popular news magazine journal in America called The New Republic. Milbank in the Washington Post and Joe Nocera in the New York Times are both predicting the demise of the New Republic as a publication. And both of them are associated, associating it with the, with the, with the new, newly rich, newly wealthy owner of the New Republic as of, I believe, 2012, if I'm not mistaken. He's only owned it a couple of years. And he's a techie, and his claim to fame was that he was lucky enough to be the roommate of Mark Zuckerberg at Harvard. So consequently, when Mark Zuckerberg hit it big, he took, and I'm, I'm stuck for the, for the name of this particular person, but he took him with him. And this is really his claim to fame. As far as a background in journalism and all that, to, to own and maintain the, the, the intellectual caliber of the New Republic, he doesn't have it. And what he's doing is trying to, trying to infuse the new elements of the so-called digital age into the New Republic and the general consensus, at least in the point of, from the point of both of these articles is that the New Republic, as we have known it throughout its existence, is dead. And that's an example, it seems to me, of the kind, and, and the contemporary nature, how relevant this is. This is in today's New York Times. So the article that Horst sent us comes from a publication in the East Bay Express the East Bay News in Oakland and Berkeley, California. It's an article by Ellen Cushing. It's an article that received 
the Arts and Culture Award for Journalism Excellence from the Society of Professional Journalists in the category or in the division for publications with circulations of less than 100,000 people. This article won that award. And we began to look at it yesterday, and what we were looking at is the nature of these people, these so-called techies, who are becoming so prominent, not only in Silicon Valley, but also in today's America. What they stand for, how they differ from the traditional elites that have dominated American society through, this, through the centuries, through the generations. Because what we are seeing here is the emergence of a whole new group of so-called newly rich, nouveau riche people who are becoming fabulously wealthy through the technological revolution as evidenced by things like Twitter and Google and Amazon and Microsoft and and the and these other companies many of them we don't even they're happening so fast change is happening so fast there and these people are basically creating small businesses hitting it big and being bought out by others for unbelievable amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars and billions of dollars, and we, we read about it all the time. It's so difficult to stay on top of it. But what's happening is that these people quickly are becoming the trendsetters for American leadership and American society in general. So consequently, it's extremely important to be aware of who these people are what they're about, what their priorities are, and what the perspective changes that seem to be in the offer, offing for America in general, for America in general, as these people acquire more and more influence and more and more power and more and more wealth. This is the so-called one percent that we hear so much about. And yesterday, in getting into this article, we began with consideration of the arts. And that's where I'd like to pick up. It has just gone the top of the hour. We're at two minutes after the hour of 2 p.m. in the East. I'd like to pause for maybe two minutes or so, two or three minutes, just to kind of get my breath and pull a few things together. And then we'll come back and we'll spend the balance of our time together on this article and we will begin where we where we uh, with issues that we addressed yesterday which is the whole issue of patron b becoming patrons of the arts what is happening and what is liable to happen to the arts in America based on the realities of what's happening in the Silicon Valley but first we'll take a short break you are listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. This is Bill O'Brien, and we'll pause for a two- or three-minute break, and then we'll be right back. Please stay with us. We're just getting started. Thank you, Bob Kincaid. Thank you for the, for the selection of music. Um, I see from your information it's called Yezu, Joy of Man's Desiring by Bach. That Bach guy is going to last, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think he's got some stay in power. That is unbelievable. Wow. What beautiful, beautiful music. Thank you, Bob. Welcome back to the second hour of the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. I am Bill O'Brien. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. If you are just joining us, welcome. If you have been with us through the first half hour of our program today, I want to thank you for staying with us. The topic is the whole idea of the nouveau riche. We're focusing specifically on the emergence of the nouveau riche in the Silicon Valley and the kinds of changes that are associated with the emergence of this new elite, as it were, in American society. And of course, the, the connection, the link here to the virtual center is the fact that the same kinds of considerations and the same kind of issues were quite evident throughout the 18th century, throughout the Confederation period, clearly evidenced at the Constitutional Convention 
in the speech, principally in the speech of Alexander Hamilton on June 18th, but in Hamilton's ninth Federalist paper as well. There are a number of issues uh, and letters from James Madison and others related to the same kind of issues. The aristocratic or upper class reaction, if you will, to Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts and what that seemed to mean for America, what that seemed to mean for Republican government in America. Uh, Washington's statement that there could be Shays Rebellions in every state in the Union because the same kind of social circumstances and conditions that existed in Massachusetts existed in other states as well. And, of course, the fact of the matter is, while Shays', Shays Rebellion of September 1786 in Massachusetts gets most of the attention from historians, the fact of the matter is there were similar outbreaks in many states in the, during the Confederation period. I'm speaking specifically of, of land reform movements in, in the Carolinas, uh, the issues of being, the West, western counties being underrepresented in the state legislatures in the Carolinas. The issue of land reform in New York State up the Hudson River in, in what, it, what is usually uh, referred to at that time and today continues as Dutchess County, New York. And there are a number of evidences of this and one of the one of the pieces of research that you might you might find interesting, I know I did at the time, I don't think I really appreciated it when I first uh, ran across this, but a good friend of mine did some research and ultimately did a master's degree um, at the University of, Con of, of Wisconsin on this issue. And the challenge was, why did Shays Rebellion happen in Massachusetts? Why didn't it happen in any number of other states? And one of the things that that the, the, my, my friend and, and colleague, Bob Becker, was able to find in his research is that different states responded differently to the challenges, to the social and economic challenges of the masses in different states. In a number of cases, specifically in seven states, states responded by printing paper money in order to make more money available to more people. It is, it seems to me, significant that in the states which printed paper money there were no rebellions like Shays. But the reason that there was a rebellion in Massachusetts and the reason there were like rebellions in other places is because Massachusetts legislature and the others were not as responsive to the to the needs and the wills of the will of the of the people as were these states who responded by printing paper money by inflating the currency and so consequently what we see is the Chase rebellion indeed becomes testimony to the breakdown between government and its own people in the state of Massachusetts. And it's that kind of situation that Madison sees the Constitution helping to resolve. I, I think that particular piece of research done by Bob Becker, who of course re he received his PhD a number of years ago, he taught and retired actually from uh, teaching history uh, Revolution history at Louisiana State University. After a number of years, he retired uh, a few years ago from from LSU. And um, so, you know, I think that particular that particular uh, master's thesis topic that Bob latched onto is, I believe, significant. Um, I think it tells us a lot. And very honestly, this is what we're looking at in the Silicon Valley because many of the characteristics, many of the changes that this group of newly wealthy, newly influential, overnight millionaires, so to speak, reflected in names like Gates and Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and a number of other names that we see all the times associated with these new, with these new companies, these new, new uh, 
new millionaires and multimillionaires that are suddenly emerging in and around the Silicon Valley. There's a change in lifestyle that's associated with these folks that it seems to me potentially will affect all of us. And that's why I think the, the, the kind of changes and the kind of assumptions that these people make about society, about themselves, about their proper role, about whether in fact they have anything resembling an obligation to the society at large, the old, the, the old uh, traditional idea that those who do the best in society have an obligation to give back to the community and make it possible for other people in the society to experience the same kind of success they did. In other words, that with, with success comes responsibility. There is a serious question as you read about what's happening in the Silicon Valley. There are serious questions as to whether there's any sense of community responsibility or obligation on the part of these people at all. They are one of the things that we noticed yesterday is that for for the most part these people seem almost to be oblivious of the society at large. They seem to operate on the assumption that the little world that they function in is the world. And that their successes are everybody else's successes. And their opportunities are the same kinds of opportunities that other people have. And the difference is that they're willing to work hard for it and therefore they deserve the rewards that go with it. But the sense of responsibility to the community at large, the sense of obligation, the commitment to community, the idea that there even is such a thing as a public interest doesn't seem to be too prominent in the Silicon Valley, at least from what we've looked at so far. And what we looked at principally yesterday was in the area of the arts. Traditionally, elites throughout history, it is the elites, the wealthy, who have patronized and made possible the stability and the expansion and the appreciation of the arts. It is in those societies which receive sub substantial support, where, where the arts receive substantial re support from the best families that art thrives and prevails and grows and appreciation for it grows and expands. However, from what we saw yesterday in the Silicon Valley, the traditional arts as we, we think of it appears to be taking a beating one of the examples we used yesterday was the difficulty that National Public Radio, NPR, public broadcasting, the difficulty that public broadcasting is having in breaking into this support group, in getting the kind of support for public radio and for the kind of programs that public radio features and public television as well. These people do not seem committed at all to the need to sustain the traditional arts. They are fascinated and infatuated with technological change, obviously. And that they're willing to put their efforts in and that they're willing to put their money in. But this is all potential venture capital. This is all investment. It's not support. It's not social obligation. It's not commitment to the arts or commitment or support for the well-being of the community at large. It's an, expand, it's an investment in technology and technological expansion. 
Money is plentiful. There's plenty of it. These people have it. They are not at all reluctant to spend it. And so consequently, the sense of balance and proportion that we all associate with the money we make and the money we earn is missing. In the world these people seem to function in, the supply of money is unlimited. There's no reason, no need, no sense of responsibility for spending your money wisely because there's always more. It seems to be a lifestyle which puts a premium on hedonism, on narcissism, on me, on self-interest, on my comfort, on my welfare. We talked yesterday using examples from this particular article we talked about examples of $5,000 bicycles and extravagant parties that, it cost, that cost obscene amounts of money. We talked about, this is in one particular sentence, we talked about a $6 bottle of Miller High Life beer, a $48 plate of fried chicken, $20 BLT in parts of San Francisco that used to feature bars and taco, and taco stands. This seems to be the future that these people are leading. They support the arts, but it's a particular brand of the arts that they support. One author has referred to them as the Microsoft Medici's referring back to the Medici's, the Italian family that is famous for patronizing the arts in, medieval, in the medieval period. There's no question, and this is just piece of information, 13 of Forbes's, Forbes magazine's 50 richest Americans in 2012 made all or almost all of their money in technology. And so consequently, those responsible for raising money in order to sustain the arts have a lot to say about what's happening. Amory Sharp, who's the Director of Development and Capital Campaigns for San Francisco's American Conservatory Theater, talks about these 20 and 30 year old guys and what their priorities are. And this is a quote that we looked at yesterday. If you're talking the symphony or other classical old man shit, I would say interest is very low. The amount of people know that give a crap about the symphony as opposed to the amount of people I know who would look at a cool stencil on the street is really small. In other words, these people don't see any need to invest and support theater, music, art, the, tr the more traditional things we associate with cultivating and promoting the arts. Consequently, they see nothing to be gained for them in supporting anything like public broadcasting, like NPR. Susan Medak, M-E-D-A-K, who is the managing director of Berkeley Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California, talks about the trouble that the San Francisco Symphony is in and how difficult it is to get these nouveau riche types to support the symphony or what the symphony stands for at all. And I'm reading this paragraph directly from the article. It reads as follows. According to Medak, Susan Medak, and other members of the art world, 
it's not just the donors themselves who are changing. It's the entire ethos. And that may mark a change in a system that's been more or less the same since the Renaissance. A lot of those philanthropic dollars are now going to programs with measurable outcomes, Medak said. This shift towards a more transactional relationship in philanthropy, where you give something and expect to get something concrete back, has continued to escalate. The entrepreneurial infatuation we have now, and I don't mean that in a loaded way, she says, comes with a notion that the things we're investing in should have a potential to make returns. It's antithetical to the kind of philanthropy that has built institutions in this country, Medak said. Basically then, what they're talking about is philanthropy that is results oriented, that has a payback, that you can measure success or measure the positive aspects from the investment, profit. In a sense, what we're talking about here is that the traditional reason for supporting the arts is not there for the most part. The idea that a culture, a civilization needs the arts that part of rearing and educating the next generation is exposing them to and encouraging them to develop an appreciation for the arts ought to be part of their upbringing is not there. All of the reasons that traditionally have been reason, reasons for promoting and supporting and patronizing the arts are not there. What is there is entrepreneurial opportunity. The opportunity to invest money in order to make more money. The opportunity to invest in things that become fads, that are flashy, that are, quote, kinky, unquote. This seems to be the place where these people are more interested in putting their money. And this is where we stopped yesterday. This article introduces a, 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 a company, an organization that I hadn't heard of before, called Kickstarter. Some of you may have heard of this operation called Kickstarter. It is a company that seems to, according to this article, runs below the surface of nearly every conversation about the Bay Area arts economy these days. It is the self-described world's largest funding platform for creative projects. Not the arts, creative projects. In its three-year existence, it has raised more than half a billion dollars for more than 90,000 projects and is getting more popular by the day. At present, it is contributing more than twice as much money as is the National Endowment for the Arts. It has doubled the amount, the amount of money that the National Endowment for the Arts puts into cultivation and sustenance of the arts in America. But what kind of art is Kickstarter, Kickstarter supporting? According to this statement, arts patronage is definitely very low, but it's like Kickstarters Oh man, that's off the map. Unquote. This is the kind of investment that the Silicon Valley community is supporting. Let me read the paragraph. 
a lot of this is about the difference between consuming culture and supporting culture. A startup world refugee told me a couple of weeks ago, if old money is investing in season tickets to the symphony and writing checks to the Legion of Honor, new money is buying ultra-limited edition indie rock LPs and contributing to arts projects on Indiegogo in exchange for early prints. If the old conception of art and philanthropy was about essentially building a civilization, about funding institutions without expecting anything in return, simply because they present an inherent, sometimes ineffable, sometimes free market defying value to society, present and future, and because they help us understand ourselves in our world in a way that can occasionally transcend popular opinion. The new one is, for better or worse, about voting with your dollars. That paragraph, it seems to me, is incredibly insightful and incredibly important. The difference between consuming culture and supporting culture. The kind of projects that old money supports as opposed to the projects that this new money is willing to support through operations like Kickstarter. If the old, and I'm reading this quote directly, if the old conception of art and philanthropy was about essentially building a civilization, about funding institutions without expecting anything in return, simply because they present an inherent, sometimes ineffable, sometimes free market defying value to society, present and future, because they help us understand ourselves in our world in a way that can occasionally transcend popular opinion. The new approach to art and philanthropy, for better or worse, is about voting with your dollars. It's about entrepreneurism, entrepreneurship. It's about free market values. It's not about donating, it's about investing. Example, don't give someone a fish. Don't even teach them how to fish. Take a look at the fisheries business plan. Decide if you'd like to support it based on a video and some short copy. And then make a one-time payment of whatever amount you'd like, most likely to exchange for some kind of concrete reward. It's not really philanthropy at all, but it's increasingly being considered that. Kickstarter and sites like it have been praised for democratizing entrepreneurship. They are, democ they are democratizing it, but in a sense they are allowing it to dictate what is sustained and what isn't, what is supported and what isn't. For example, according to this article, the most successful campaign that Kickstarter has done so far in the area of tech-oriented, flashy, and novel is Pebble, a smartwatch that connects to a smartphone via Bluetooth. Its designers were able to raise more than $10 million in a matter of weeks for Pebble. Last year, there was a campaign to create a 10-year hoodie, a hooded sweatshirt made with cutting-edge textiles and technique and meant to last a full decade. It raised nearly half a million dollars, 10 times more than its goal, its objective. What kinds of projects, what kinds of culture are growing up and emerging 
within the so-called Nouveau Riche Silicon Valley. The emergence of a company like one called Ernest Sohn, S-E-W-N, Ernest Sohn, which is a high-end luxury denim brand, well known because it's a favorite of Twitter founder Jack Dorsey. Another company that Kickstarter has helped support, Beta Brand, a district-based online clothing retail retailer that sells product like dress pants, sweatshirt, sweatpants, and bike to work pants that has cuffs that roll up to reveal super bright reflective material in the lining and sell for upwards of $100 a pair. A third kind of company doing well is, a, is an outfit, an operation called Cubify, C-U-B-I-F-Y, Cubify. It basically talks about manufacturers in the tech world of the toy of the moment. A 3D printer that, that retails for more than a thousand dollars each. That's where the money is going. They call it philanthropy. However, it is not philanthropy in the traditional sense at all. It is not sustaining a civilization. It's perpetuating their own. It's feeding their own narcissism, their own self-interest. If you move beyond the arts, which this article does, into restaurants, you begin to find that the restaurant business is one of the biggest booming side operations or or ancillary operations in the region because many of these people quote eat out three times a day they don't cook they don't shop supermarkets they eat out when they entertain they entertain lavishly an example a startup company called Kitchet K-I-T-C-H-I-T, Kitchit, will allow people to host their own dinner parties by bringing in name brand chefs who will shop for, prepare, serve, and clean up after me in in-home meals that range anywhere from $35 a person to $85 a person. There's another company called TaskRabbit, which basically features personal, assi personal assistant kind of tasks, like doing your laundry, buying your groceries, doing your household chores, doing your ironing. TaskRabbit charges a uniform $20 an hour for whatever, whatever it is you want them to do. Here's a story that will give you a flavor of that. It was ridiculous. These people, they didn't want to iron. Changing pages here. They did not want to iron anything, but they wanted everything, including their t-shirts, ironed. So therefore, you hire people at minimum wage, other 24-year-olds just like you, to do your ironing and your cooking and to clean your house and walk your dog and do your grocery shopping. And whatever else mundane activities that these people find themselves too busy to do or who see themselves as being above this. In 2011, 
the medium income median income in America was thirty two thousand five hundred and eighty one dollars in Silicon Valley in 2011 the median in, median income exceeded a hundred thousand dollars a year but as we mentioned earlier these people feel that they deserve it they've got the kind of money they've got because they're willing to work for it and they're creative let me share this paragraph with you because it deals with the old idea of the casual nature of this nouveau riche San Francisco is and always has been an extraordinarily casual culture and in technology that ethos is occasionally taken to absurd extremes quote the people with money are the guys wearing skinny jeans for the first time instead of the bankers I know very few billionaires that wear suits the ones that I've met wear hoodies and jeans it's been fascinating to see the way this has driven affluent culture to the casual if the old status symbol was a four thousand dollar suit and the new one is a pair of, le of salvage jeans and a three hundred dollar flannel shirt that's more than just a trend it's a whole new way of thinking about consumption and status in a recent story the Wall Street Journal wrote the following an image that evokes stately power say for example a Park, Park Avenue co-op complete with a Baroque library isn't a shared aspiration in the technology world the authors of this Wall Street Journal article Richard Morgan and Aaron Rutkoff went on to quote Ricky Van Veen the boy billionaire who founded collegehumor.com why not get a Kindle and then turn that room into something really awesome instead of a Baroque library I think what we're seeing here is the difference in balance and perspective and appreciation or lack of appreciation for tradition and culture and civilization and the elements of civilization let alone the absence of any willingness to see themselves carrying any sense of obligation to the society at large it almost appears to be runaway narcissism if you don't have a lot of other friends except tech people like yourself it's normal the long hours and the degree you work you deserve it you work hard you deserve every penny you get there's a story in here which, which I find quite comical it's an anecdote about a table of female models eating at an expensive steakhouse in Manhattan New York female models out to lunch or out to dinner in a steakhouse a group of men sitting at a nearby table passed them a napkin and scrawled on the napkin was an email address and the email address was Iamrich at google dot com I am rich at google.com the author here points out that in fact the person who passed the napkins name is rich his surname is Pleth P-L-E-E-T-H which is difficult to pronounce over the phone so he uses I am rich at google.com as a way to introduce himself basically what Pleath told the author P 
People in tech aren't very flashy, he says. It's not like bankers who go to the club and get 10 bottles of Dom Perignon with, like, fireworks in it. It's low-key wealth. It's a particular brand of low-key wealth. But as the author points out, it can lead to a false sense of self. Consumption is still consumption, even if it's not as conspicuous. If the billionaire, if Mark Zuckerberg is wearing a hoodie and jeans, it may not be conspicuous consumption, but it's consumption. Class is harder to see, but that doesn't make it any less real. And then the article raises a term, introduces a term, which we haven't introduced yet, called the idea of, in French, noblesse oblige. The obligations of the nobility. Noblesse oblige. The obligations of the nobility. Going all the way back to 18th century France of Louis XIV. The assumption being that if you are in the nobility, if you are a noble, then you have certain obligations to the society at large because the society at large looks up to you, models itself after you, respects you, seemingly worships you. The stories about Louis XIV riding through the streets of Paris <coughs> in his carriage and holding his hands and arms out the window of the carriage in order to give the people an opportunity to touch the cuffs of the king, to touch the lace cuffs of the king. The whole idea is that the nobility needs to be visible. It needs to be conspicuous. It needs to dress the part. It needs to drive the part. When you travel around, you do so in limousines. You do not do it in a Ford Focus, for example. The traditional idea is that there are obligations associated with nobility, with success, with power. But the key is that in order for those obligations to be realized, the nobility needs to be visible. People need to know who the nobility is in order to look to them to fulfill the obligations of nobility. But what we're dealing with here is an inconspicuous nobility. It's clearly a consumption-driven society, pure and simple. It's entrepreneurism writ large. It's self-interest. It's position, it's influence. But it's not that visible. Consequently, it's hard for the masses of the people to identify the nobility. Because it is so inconspicuous, its obligations seem to be less and less important until they disappear totally. In other words, one of the things that this nouveau riche situation in the Silicon Valley in the world of technology is producing is a nobility free of the obligations traditionally associated with noblesse oblige. People don't know who they are. So consequently, they don't look to them to do anything unique or special. And because they seek 
to become invisible within society at large these people do not take on the traditional responsibilities and obligations of nobility if you believe that the philanthropic efforts of the aristocracy is critical to the future of the arts if you believe that the kinds of traditional obligations of nobility that traditionally have gone with influence and power throughout most societies it's really hard to measure what this society is going to be like without them we're already begin to see beginning to see it in that support for the arts is disappearing it's not that their willingness to support and invest is not is not there it is but they are looking for payback they grow up in a world with measurable objectives they grow up in a world that is quantitative they function in a world in which numbers dictate success if it doesn't generate numbers if it doesn't produce outcomes that are measurable then it's not worth supporting it's expendable how long can the society and the culture and the civilization that we know and that most of us here at the virtual center and on the horn generally support the literature the art the culture the architecture the appreciation for beauty all of those things we traditionally associated associate with the arts how long can they continue to flourish and function without the kind of patronage and the kind of support that they have traditionally been able to depend upon and what will happen to our society what will happen to our young without them <clears throat> more important than that i think is the other side of that coin once you get rid of the arts once you totally as a culture as a society you totally buy into the idea that the only only the things the only things that have value are the things with measurable outcomes and paybacks so that you can measure success as long as we begin to move in the direction of believing that only those are society's priorities and anything that you can't measure and that you can't look to an outcome or a profit or growth or whatever else whatever other kind of measure you choose to use then those things slip through the cracks because they are not cultural or cultural priorities any longer what do we say what can we anticipate about a society that puts all of its stock in measurable outcomes in bottom lines in profits in increasing values of stock in short-term measurements of the stock market in short-term investment in stocks with measurable paybacks in the economy what we're seeing is that companies rather than reinvesting profit back into the enterprise have taken to distributing profit among shareholders stockholders because the assumption is and the reality of the business world is that you take care of your shareholders first and what's left goes into the enterprise 
Consequently, you can justify those who own the stock, those who are at the top, getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier as the stock market continues to escalate. But at the same time, without the investment in the enterprise itself, jobs disappear, salaries go down, unemployment happens, natural tendency to increase the value of stock is to reduce expenses, cut workforce, cut labor costs. And what you do is exemplify and expand a difficult problem into even a more serious one. I think the issue of noblesse oblige and the lack of visibility of this particular aristocracy is particularly important. And I don't want to run over here. We're at 55. We've got five minutes, so I've got one issue, time for one issue left. And it's the issue of risk. One would think that a, a culture, a, a group of people that put so much stock in entrepreneurism, in the, in the market, in investment, in profit, in measurable outcomes, and all the rest of it, one would assume that this group of people would be comfortable with risk and would recognize both the dangers and the advantages of high-risk ventures. But the fact of the matter is, in the little sheltered world that they live in, it appears that they really can't handle risk. We get into the issue of financial planning. These people don't plan. They live paycheck to paycheck. They live big paycheck to paycheck. But they don't plan because they assume that with, where there has been unending amounts of money coming in, it'll continue to come in. They really believe that their skills are in demand, that they can literally walk down the street and get another job, and of course the reality is in many cases they're right. But the fact of the matter is that one of the things that's happening is a growing poverty rate in Silicon Valley. Because the fact of the matter is the equivalent of the 1% that we talk about all the time that's realizing most of the profits of the recovery in the American economy, <coughs> we see that same kind of thing happening in the Silicon Valley. As with the amount of money flowing in and out, it stands to reason that even within this context, the few are doing well and the many increasingly are not. And so what you begin to get is something I marked on my, my hard copy of the article, a quite different but equally serious version of the 1%. Simply put, while the ultra-rich are getting richer, record numbers of Silicon Valley residents are slipping into poverty. And here's a quote in the very last paragraph of this article, and I think it's a good way to end here as we are at 2.58. We have less than two minutes to go. We can dream, and this is the world we made. We have all these capabilities, and what are we going to do? We're going to figure out how to monetize some poor folks, poor folks in the center of the country who we've convinced need to buy some things that they don't actually need. That's what life is about. Marketing, PR, advertising, selling. I think it's frightening. If it was limited to the Silicon Valley and to a few people, it would be an interesting novel. It would be good fiction. The fact of the matter is these are the trendsetters. These are the people that we look to as we scope out what our future is going to look like. 
these people can't look at the future because they can't even understand the present. They are leading. They are creating the world of the future for all of us. And they can't even envision it. How frightening. It's 59 minutes after the hour. We're done for today, and we'll be back tomorrow here with the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Have a wonderful evening. Be safe. By all means, be safe, because we want you back with us. And thank you.